Okay. Well, welcome uh, to our, our seminary training this morning. It's exciting for the summer to be meeting together at all these times, and I hope that these things will benefit you as we, uh, as we prepare and work this year. The topic that we're talking about today is connecting gospel principles to Jesus Christ and emphasizing his example. I think this is something that we've been trying to do for as long as I've been teaching, which is about 25 years in seminary and institutes. We've, we've tried to take the gospel principles that we're seeing and tie them back to the Savior. And the Old Testament has been something that has helped us do that a lot, I think. We've had all the sacrifices and the signs and the, I think our students, at least in my experience, our students are getting better and better at doing that more quickly, at least than I was. My favorite comment this last semester was we were going through the different tribes of Israel and identifying who was what. Set up straight, classy goes, those are the tribes we're trying to gather now. (laughs) that's light bulb. <laughs> that is so fun. It's those light bulb moments are it's like worth all of the weeks of wondering if anybody's listening sometimes. Uh, that is I, I love it. It's it is amazing to me something Elder um, Hafen said years ago. He said, as we talk more of Christ, the, the gospel's doctrinal fullness will come out of obscurity. Um, that was from a talk in 2004. And I think that is what we're trying more and more to do. A lot of things are coming out of obscurity with the expansion of learning and the internet and all the other things that are going on in our world today. So many things are becoming more and more apparent to our students earlier on in their lives. And we face a challenge as teachers to not do things the way we've always done them, to to open our minds and to allow the inspiration revelation that's flowing down just as quickly as everything else is expanding and help our students to see Jesus in these stories and these examples even sooner than we have in the past. I looked through as I prepared for this and I thought, what was going to be the most helpful thing for you teachers? And I thought, Let's choose some, a really well-known scripture story and let's, let's get in there and we'll see Jesus all over it. And that is something that I think we could do and that would be a productive thing. And, but a lot of times, especially in trainings, we'll choose something that's fairly easy to do where we can see Jesus easily. Um, and as I look forward, I saw that in the first like three or four weeks of the school year, we're going to jump straight into Isaiah. That's going to be a, a joyful experience that we go through in the fall. And so I thought, let's, let's talk about Isaiah for a few minutes. Let's read some Isaiah passages together and see if we can see Jesus Christ in, the, in these Isaiah things and maybe show us the pattern that Jesus Christ, not only his nature, but his example shows up even in, the, uh, in some of the Isaiah passages that we are are super familiar with, or maybe some that we are not. And so I want to just begin, if if we'll open up to Isaiah, let's open up to Isaiah chapter one. You'll be teaching this, I think, the first week of September uh, from what the Come Follow Me shows. shows. And I wanted to together look at some of some Isaiah passages, and we're not going to study chapters, obviously, just for lack of time here. But I wanted to give you a few things that would help you with Isaiah and then have us together have an experience where we look at maybe a poem or two of Isaiah where we see the Savior in there and his example and kind of set a pattern of the way that we can help our students to see the Savior even more. Um, if you remember in 1 Nephi 19.23, this is a, one of the scripture masteries from when I was in high school. It was, he said, you know, I, I did read unto think, to them many things that were written in the books of Moses, but that I might fully, more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord, their Redeemer. I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. That's what Nephi said. He saw Jesus all over Isaiah. And I think if we can help our students to connect Isaiah 
to the princi those principles that are taught there to the Savior and see his example, even in the book of Isaiah, it's going to be an incredible experience, I think, for your students to be able to, uh, if they can connect Isaiah there, it's a lot easier to connect someone like King David and some of the other uh, people that we're talking about. Um, and so I want to just tell you two quick things about Isaiah. One, Isaiah is poetry. You know this and you've studied this for a long time. And it's not poetry like we would talk about where some things rhyme. There's no rhyme in Hebrew poetry. Poetry in Hebrew is repetition. There's many forms of it, but you see that where he'll say something and then he'll say it again slightly different. He says something and he says it again slightly different. That's a, a form of poetry in Hebrew. That's how your students can recognize that. If we read through trying to look for a story, we're going to get pretty bogged down and our students are going to get very confused. The other thing is, is that Isaiah is not just a poem, it is a collection of poetry. So, for example, I believe there's seven poems in Isaiah chapter one. So let's go to Isaiah chapter one and look at this. Uh, the first poem goes verses one through four. Do you notice what's different about verse five? Like right by the number or right after the number. See the little paragraph looking marker thing? That can be a signal to you as you read through, hey, this is a new poem beginning here in Isaiah. And so if you look at that, there's one of those in verse 5. There's one of those in verse 10. There's one of those in verse 16. There's one of those in verse 21. There's one of those in verse 25 and another one in verse 28. So if you look at Isaiah chapter 1 and you say, this is, what is that, seven poems in one chapter. Sometimes we'll say, oh, let's read this chapter. That's a nice chunk. But a lot of times, if you read the chapter, he's switching, he switches ideas. You've probably noticed that about Isaiah. You start seeing something, saying something, and then he's just talking about something completely different. And we're like, wait a second, you lost me. You were just talking about vineyards. And now all of a sudden, you, you know, you're, you're talking about somebody that is ill and needs a doctor. Oh, and now you're talking about, uh, you know, a war, and you're like, what's going on? This is all in one chapter. I say, why do you keep switching what you're talking about? It's because we're reading through a collection of poetry. Just like you wouldn't take a Shel Silverstein book. You guys familiar with Shel Silverstein? Kind of nonsensical or just kind of, kind of goofy poems. If you just read one of his collections through, you'd be like, what are you talking about? You're crazy. You keep switching topics. Yeah, because each poem is a different poem. That's exactly what I was just, I was literally just writing that down. Like to, to, as we teach this, I thought that was a great, a great thought. I thought I was just writing down kind of like a shell silver. If you take where the sidewalk ends and yeah. just put that all like right next to each other and go, okay, we're going to just read this through. In fact, I might do that. Like yes. just print out a bunch of his poems, just all right next to each other and have them read them. I that literally, that's just what I was thinking. I thought that's funny that you would say the same, the same poet that I thought of. It's beautiful. I've done that with my students for years. We look at, we read three or four Shel Silver scenes and I'll say, what is the, what's the, what's the uh, story about? And, but there, there's no story because there's four different poems. Each one you can understand individually, but when we stack them on top of each other, sometimes we go, this does not making any sense. So these paragraph markers have helped me tremendously as I study Isaiah. That helps. Then Jesus comes out a lot more. A lot more is not confusing. Jesus is not try to uh, have so much that it that we don't understand what's going on. And so if we can read each individual poem together at, with our students and help our students to to do that in their own study, all of a sudden Jesus comes into focus a lot stronger. So let's I want to let's just read the very first poem uh, together. Let's let's just go verses two through four. Is there someone that is willing to just be our voice and read that for us? I'll do that. Okay, Sister Mora, before you read, uh -huh. as, as she reads, look for the repetition. He'll say something, and then he says it again. He says something, then he says it again. So, and sometimes he'll say that, he'll do that twice, and then he'll have like a zinger line at the end. Say it, repeat it, say it, repeat it, zinger. Say it, repeat it, say it, repeat it, say it, repeat it, zinger. And that's kind of how it works. 
you'll see that pattern as we go through. But what I want you to do is I want you to, as, as Sister Moore reads these three verses, verses two, three, and four in Isaiah chapter one, I want you to just see what's the message. Do you see Jesus in here at all? Do you see anything about his example to us as he talks to Israel in these three verses? Go ahead. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master. Crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. O sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. That is the first poem of Isaiah. <laughs> if we were just to read verses 1 through 30, we would see a lot of these different things said, but there's three verses. Where do you see the Savior in there, and what do you see about the Savior's example or his character from three verses kicking off Isaiah? And what an intro, by the way. Well, he, he identifies himself as a parent, as a caretaker, um, as a what teacher. Words, what, what words show you that he's a parent or a caretaker, Sister Mora? Um, I have nourished and brought up children. Yeah. is that an interesting idea? The, right from the beginning, the Lord is showing himself as a parent who, when you think of nourishing a child, when they're small, they nurse or we have formula, if you can get it in the stores these days, right? They're drinking just milk for the first almost six months, maybe close to a year of their life. Then we give them a little bit of rice cereal. This is a long process to nourish and bring up children. <clears throat> so when you think about that, a, a parent, um, That's fine. Sister Schmidt, don't worry about it. Um, the, uh, what, what, does that, what does that tell you about the Savior's example when you read that in this poem? One of the things that I think about when they talk, you know, when he says, I have nourished and brought up children, as we went through Exodus and <clears throat> throughout Exodus, the, the Lord tells Moses and tells the children of Israel, remember this, remember this, remember, remember all the things I've done. And to this day, I have um, in my family, um, in my husband's family, um, my brother-in-law, he's, his wife is Jewish. And so we have um, spent Passover with them before. And it's, and it's interesting to me, and we've gone to my nephew's bar mitzvah, and and it's interesting how that is a that is a thing that they do. They really, really do still recite the Exodus and recite the blessings of the Exodus. And but it's interesting to me that that throughout this, that's a, that's a a commandment that they've been given to remember what the Lord has done for them, and to remember how the Lord has been their parent and how the Lord has watched over and taken care of them. And that to me is, it's, it like jumps out when we just took those few verses, it that jumped out to me that, Hey, I told you to do this. I have, I, I've, I've, I have brought you up and now you, unlike all these other examples of, you know, the, the ox and, you know, the, the people, the things that, that always do recognize and know their master, you've forgotten me. Hmm. And so what is that, what conclusions or what, uh, what do you learn about God and uh, Jesus from, from that symbolic thing about them being a parent with rebellious children? That he's going to have to treat us like rebellious children from time to time. <laughs> that, you know, that there are, there are rules there. It's like, 
you know, every, every one of us who's a parent has, has told our kids, Hey, there are, there are rules to this house, you know, yep. and you have to obey the rules of the house. And, and we may go back and kind of go, you know, look, don't you see what we've done for you here? And, um, there are rules to the house and you, you have to obey the rules or there's going to be consequences. He doesn't say he's, he's frustrated. He says he's angry. We provoked the Lord to anger. Isn't that an interesting poetic form there of the anger of the Lord? He's angry because his children have, what does he say? They have, uh, what does it say? They've gone away backward. Oh yeah, they've gone away backward. <laughs> they've regressed which is you know yeah. which as a parent if you watch your kids like make make some progress and then regress it it yeah it kind of kills you it hurts your heart this is a pleading as much as anything oh goodness the pain that you're in i see it and i that, i know how i could help you with it which brings us by the way to the next next poem it's five through nine it's uh what is that? Five, five verses there. Five through nine. All of a sudden, this is a new poem, but it's continuing the same theme. But it's not about a parent anymore. This is now about a physician or a doctor that's trying to help a patient. Again, a new theme because we've got a new poem. The theme, I guess, is the same, but it's a new subject. Let's look at these. And as we go through this, I would, I'd like you to mark or just make mental note of or take a note. What are, what are the words of um, hope that you see in five through nine? I'll, I'll read. Why should ye be stricken anymore? And by the way, the word stricken means sick. You're struck with a disease. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. And the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. Soundness being wholeness or um, health, to be sound. There is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Were there any words of hope there? <laughs> well, he does say in verse nine, except the Lord left us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and Gomorrah. So that seems like a little bit of hope, right? <laughs> I love that, Sister Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. That's just that little bit of hope. Sometimes when our, our kids or a loved one is kind of on a really hard path, it is, it is uh, sometimes just the smallest glimmer of hope. Ooh, he answered my text. <laughs> He's, he starts with a question. Why would you be stricken more? Ye will, will revolt more and more, which suggests that you could stop at any point along the way here and reverse course. Isn't that interesting? He's not causing it to you. He's not the one who's made you sick. He's the one that has the Neosporin and the Band-Aids. If you'll just stay still long enough to let me clean that cutout. But instead, it's what? Wounds, bruises, and putrefying sores. Um, Looks like cyber said mollified equals hope. That's a hopeful word to mollify. I'm not exactly sure, but it says mollified with ointment. Let me see if it gives a definition here in the gospel library. It says softened, softened with ointment. 
That is a very hopeful thing. The healing that the Savior offers. Sister Fishbaugh? I, I felt like it, he was speaking of our country. <laughs> uh, isn't that beautiful uh, how uh, Isaiah, because it's a poem, you can take it and apply it to so many different areas, whether it is a country or to Israel or to an individual's life. The applications are so broad. <clears throat> when you hear our country like that, what, what hope do you have when you hear the Lord talking like this? Well, I just feel like if we always seek for him and, and follow his commandments, that there will always be hope. We are that remnant. We are the ones that will be with him and fight with him and struggle until he calls us. Thank you. Beautifully said. So here's two poems we've looked at so far. We've seen some hope from the Savior in softening up our wounds. We've seen hope from the first poem that he is a parent who's been nurturing us all along. That's a beautiful thing. Other thoughts? What other uh, images of hope or images of the Savior and his example came to your mind as you read? Sister Stevens? It looks like verse eight is interesting to me. Where he talks about is left as a cottage in a vineyard or a lodge in a garden of cucumbers. That's kind of interesting uh, terminology, but to me, that's like, you know, you may be a besieged city, but you are surrounded by good, you know. Maybe that's hope. I love that. That's beautiful. It's a beautiful image there of the abundance and the surrounding things. Okay, let's do the next poem. 10 through 15. Here's another thing to know about Isaiah. Because he's writing a poetic form, he sometimes will say things, the Lord will say things that you're like, I don't know that Jesus would necessarily say this to somebody. But because he's writing in poetry, he calls Israel names. Um, oh, Cyber says, uh, verse eight, the footnote says that uh, lodge in the garden of cucumbers is a watchman's hut. So kind of a lonely vigil there to watch over the cucumbers in a, in a uh, little place. But in verse 10, like the Lord is going to call Israel names. Can, does somebody, would somebody like to read or I'm happy to read, but if, if somebody would like to love I can to do it again, share that. Okay. Sister Mora. Go 10 through 10 through 15. 15. Okay. And this, this poem to me, just as thinking of the Lord as a parent just kind of breaks my heart as I hear the Lord's pleading in these verses. Go ahead. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths and calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even if the, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. I brought Isaiah out on purpose, but uh, the because ready, go, help your students to see Jesus in these passages. <laughs> it's not the easiest thing. This is not a very simple thing, but where do you see the Savior in there? And what emotions do you feel coming from the Lord in these, verse, in these verses? Well, if you don't mind, Brother Fear, I... 
I see so much of the Lord saying, enough with your sacrifices. The best way to show me you love me is obedience. Don't just sacrifice and pray and, and do these things, but be obedient. Be obedient. That's the highest form of sacrifice. Thank you. You know, we have repentance, um, which I love the description of it as being the Lord's method of character development. And if you are repeating the same things and repenting of them over and over and over and over again in the name of um, style, <laughs> you know, that you're not really learning anything and nothing is changing. If you go through these motions over and over and over again, you haven't learned anything. You haven't changed at all. There's not, you're not coming closer to me and increasing this relationship with me. You're just jumping through the hoops in the name of it for appearances. Mm. That's exactly what I was along those lines is what I was thinking, because when he talks about that, he hates all of these sacrifices that they're giving. These sacrifices are specifically what he told them to do. I mean, he, we have Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And I mean, we have books full of the old Testament that detail specifically that this is exactly what they're supposed to do and tells them that if they don't do it, that they are evil. And that, that, and, but that they need to, but what Isaiah, I think is telling them here is that understand the reason behind why you're doing it. And that, that rather than being like a vein, you know, it, and it reminded me of prayer, you know, of vain repetitions and of, you know, do we, and when I was a, a child, my father used to, you know, when we would say family prayer and my prayer sometimes would be exactly, you know, word for word, what I'd said the night before. And, um, and you know, he would take the opportunity sometimes, sometimes really kindly and sometimes with a little more frustration to help me understand that, that the Lord's not asking for me to just say words. He's asking for me to, to actually bring, bring an intent to that prayer. And I think that's what Isaiah is saying here to Israel and to us is when we approach the Lord, whether it's through the, the prescribed sacrifices of the Old Testament or whether it's through the the sacrament or prayers or temple attendance that we have today that it's not just the doing of the action it is it's what we bring behind that and how we approach that that we recognize we're approaching the lord not that we're just doing an action thank you so much leah green says he is also asking what is the purpose of our sacrifices he wants our hearts that's a great that's Go ahead. Brother Fears, this is uh, Sister Jorgette. Just to kind of add on to that, I think I see personally, and sorry, I don't have the capability for um, video today. Um, but a, you know, in these these scriptures, this particular poem going along with sacrifices, what I see in this is um, corruption. I see that that there has been doctrine given, and that these people have taken tradition and the world and infused them into the doctrine so that they are worshiping or sacrificing on their own terms instead of how the Lord has prescribed it. And he's saying, if you do that, then you are hypocrites. And, and it's, not, it's, it's not what it was meant to be and, and the blessings that you might expect from sacrifice are not going to be yours. Um, and that if we turn more towards, I mean, the, the true doctrine, which leads us to the savior, that's where the blessings are. So that's what I got from it. That's Thank it. You. <laughs> Thank you. That's the beauty of Isaiah. I love it because so many different images and words speak to each individual person. As you're teaching your students, you may, you may see a, something super clearly in these Isaiah verses, but your students are going to be seeing a dozen different things words and phrases that kind of speak out to them. I, I thought it was interesting. Sister Fishbaugh said, that seems like our country. <laughs> she, she raised that and is seeing it through this other paradigm. I, when I had read that, I didn't think at all of our country. Uh, not because I'm trying to be not thoughtful, but that, that was just something that had spoken to her. And you'll see that with your students as you go through poem by poem through Isaiah, they will see Jesus. They will hear the pleading of the Savior. 
with his people. They'll hear a little bit of some frustration, but some hope. And Isaiah never gives a bunch of poems in a row that are just negative. He'll give some negative ones and then he'll turn and give a hopeful one. It's kind of like, this is what you're doing. This is why it's hurting other, other people. Here's some hope. This is what you're doing. This is what's frustrating about what you're doing, but here's some hope. And speaking of hope, go ahead, Sister Mora. I was just going to say, speaking of hope, uh, you know, one of the things that I like about some of this poetry and in the Old Testament is that we get some, we have a lot of fire and brimstone and, and Heavenly Father being angry and grumpy, but we have a lot of emotion from the Savior. So he's not just this, you know, ethereal, untouchable um, perfect person who we can't approach in any way. He has sorrow, he has hope, he has frustration, he's angry. He's this whole gamut of emotions that kind of gives moody teens permission um, to have some feelings and to approach their savior with those feelings in prayer. You know, the one place you get to rant is to Heavenly Father who's not going to judge you for it, you know? That is such a great point. Teenagers are feeling all the emotions all the time. I mean, we do that. I mean, as a 50 year old, I still go through my emotional, all the things, but I love that idea of having permission because we, and, and Paul says that in Hebrews chapter four, where he says, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He knows, he gets it. He's, he's gone through it all. I love that. What, what a beautiful thing for your students to go through and see the emotion that God feels. I think about Moses chapter seven, where God is weeping over his children. I would say our heavenly parents are weeping over their children. And, and, and Enoch is just blown away. You're God. How can you be weeping? <laughs> you know, you, you're so great. Of course, you don't, you're not touched by any of this. And then the Lord says, no, this is personal to me. This is my family. And he says, let me give you a feeling. And he, he touches Enoch's heart. And Enoch says his heart swelled wide as eternity. And he got a view for a moment of the view of our heavenly parents. And he said, he saw all the pain and the misery and the people destroyed in the flood. And he said, I refuse to be comforted. This is too painful. It hurts too much. And then the Lord says, lift up your eyes and be glad. And he looks and sees the savior lifted up on the cross. And it says, and Enoch says, and Enoch rejoiced because of what that meant that all the pain was worth it. All the pain would be swallowed up in the healing of Jesus Christ. And that's the beautiful thing about, I think, Isaiah. It shows the Lord frustrations, but it shows how quickly he is to forgive and to heal and to work with and to bless. Um, something in the chat here, let's see. Leah Green says, also, it seems to be speaking of holiday worship, like celebrating the new moon, the feast, the special times. Where are we in the daily tasks, day in and day out, hour by hour? Am I thinking of the Savior through the hours of the day and calling on him? Thank you, Leah. That's a, that's a, a really cool uh, thought and idea. Um, <laughs> guilty as charged on that one of, of being so caught up with what's going on in the world. But let's go, let's go to 16 through 19. Uh, I mean, 16 through 20. This is the next poem. Again, as you go through Isaiah and as you read poem to poem, each poem makes sense in itself. You don't have to wonder why he's changing topics because we've already covered you're dumber than an animal and the animals know who's feeding them, but you don't. And you're a rebellious teenager. We've had you are sick and you have bruises and sores and cuts that are infected and you won't let me get in there and clean them. They get better if you let me clean them, but you just want to hold on to it for some reason. But I have the Neosporin and I'm ready. Let's, let's work together. And then the frustration of, ah, oh, 
you're doing all the religious, you're going through every motion in the world. But when you, when, when I look down at you and the, the uh, Israelites used to pray with their hands raised to heaven, that was their, their manner of prayer. We got the folding your arms and closing your eyes from some stories that Jesus told and some parables he told in the, uh, in the new Testament. So we think, Oh, that's the best way to pray is looking down. But back then they would look to heaven and put their hands up. And he says, when you pray, I look down and I see that your hands are full of blood. In other words, you're holding hatred and hostility and anger towards your brothers and sisters. And it's hard to have that conversation with you in that, in that state. Um, and then, so let's go to 16, 16 through 20. Okay. Sister Mora, you've done a good job reading for us. We do this one too. Yeah. And, and again, he's, he's, he's expressed the frustration and now here's the hope. Go ahead. Wash you, make you clean and put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the father, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Gotta love that great mouth imagery in those last couple of verses. <laughs> if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if not, the land's going to eat you. <laughs> The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Great poetry. That one, I think the hope comes out really obvious in here. What do you see about the Savior's example in these verses, 16 through 20? You know, the Lord can see everything even the things we think we're doing in hiding or in private. So to put away your evil doings from before mine eyes means to stop them completely. Cease to do evil. I think he's teaching them how. Uh, for a lot of people, they don't know any other way but to live like that. And he's giving them, you know, an out. This is how you do it. I will show you the way, but you have to be willing. You don't have to do it because you were told to. And that's why he's saying, be willing and obedient. Don't come in here going, but, 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 you know, but they, but I go in there um, with an open heart. Beautiful. Thank you. I remember um, we had a, a family that joined the ward several years ago, and they they were the Starbucks Sunday morning with a newspaper kind of people. And it was really interesting to watch them learn to change habits. And um, he would often he was called to, um, I think, uh, um, as a counselor in the elders quorum at some point. And he would come to ward council when he was filling in and he would sit there and say, how do we do family home evening? Teach us these new habits because we want to do them. We just don't know how. And that's why it's important for us to be a safe place where people can ask those questions. Um, you're not going to get questions if you feel judged. No, my favorite example, um, we lived in this teeny tiny little town in Tennessee, Jackson, Tennessee. And um, we had um, we had a family join the church, join our ward. And it was unheard of at that time for a whole family to join. It was we were just so excited. She had two boys. One of them was 12 and one was 10. And she came to me and said, where do I buy the deacon's uniform? And I was really puzzled. And I the next Sunday, I looked at the, the deacon sitting up at the front and I realized that we only had one store in town. And so they all bought the same clothes because that was the only thing available to buy. <laughs> the only variation was their tie, same pants, same shirt, same shoes, all of it. And so someone looking in would think that was a uniform, you know? And so I had a chuckle and I explained it to her. Um, 
but yeah, if I had, I could have been really mean about that, you know, and say, how could you not know? But yeah, it, it, it needed to be a safe place to ask the question. That's such a great point. Sister Johnston Taylor, did you have something you were going to share? Oh, yeah. Um, I One thing that came out to me in this that I think has been brought up in both of those other comments is I love how, you know, he says in verse 16, when he says, wash, make you clean, put away the evils of your doing from before my eyes and cease to do evil. I'm always reminded of, you know, we go again all the way back um, when the Lord is giving the law and this, you know, you can, you can divide out the 10 commandments into, um, into love the Lord and love your neighbor, you know, which then when Christ is asked in the new Testament, what is the great commandment in the law? You know, they're referring to this huge long law of, of sacrifices and, and bathings and all of that. And says, you know, what are the two great commandments in the law and, um, or what is the great commandment in the law? And, and to me, Isaiah answers this here when he's, when he's saying you're dirty, you're bloody, your hands are bloody, make yourself clean. And the way you make yourself clean by loving the, you love the Lord by doing well to others. And, um, and the, the, you know, so I think a lot of us in today's time, and I think a lot on the, a lot of us really focus in on, on the performances that we need to do, but we need to also pay attention to, which I think is what he was talking about in the earlier poems of not, this is not just performance based. This is, are you loving God through loving your neighbor and through, through being godlike to those around you and showing judgment to those who who, like Sister Mora was saying, you know, like who are coming and kind of going, who are outside, who, who don't, who are different than us, you know, who maybe, you know, who are trying to come to, go, to God, but are doing it in a way that is maybe unfamiliar to us. Are we meeting them where they are, like the Lord meets us where we are? Are we meeting them where they are and helping them along? Many not wearing the uniform that we would expect them to be wearing sometimes. They look around and go, everybody's wearing a uniform here. I don't, I, I don't have it. But that, that's such a that's such a great point of the being willing to embrace and love. And um you're just that's kind of blowing my mind. I'm gonna have to think about that some more this morning. The idea of loving God and loving your neighbor is totally in here. And that the whole law points back to all of that. Leah Green says, I keep thinking of the phrase, come from where they are, be the safe place to wash clean. Remember the feelings. Come now and let us reason together. Let us learn. And you will not see the scarlet anymore. You will see the white and forgive yourself by coming to me, God. This is, as, uh, that's a, uh, if reading that as a, forgiving yourself verse is very helpful. We could go on with the rest of the chapter. I hope this is helpful to you to read in little segments with your students and you don't have to go one after the other but it, for me as i study isaiah it's so interesting to see you hear the voice of the lord you begin to hear you feel the emotions of the lord you feel the the hope and the the pleading with israel the pleading with individuals to come to him and you also see these kind of cycles go where all is lost but there's hope all is lost but there's hope and I mean, let's illustrate that one more time here, 21 through 24. Again, there was just hope. The Lord just did hope. And if this was a story, everything from here would be hope. But guess what? He goes right back to verse 21. How is the faithful city, that's Jerusalem, become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord, the God, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, 
I will ease me of my adversaries and avenge me of my enemies. Again, right back, right back to, yeah, you, you were a faithful city. Now you're a harlot. That's, that's a pretty vivid description, but look at 25 through 27. I will turn my hand upon thee. This is a new poem and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning. And afterwards thou shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. All right. From these Isaiah experiences, we've tied many of them back to the savior and the way he feels about us. What, where do you see the example of the savior? What examples of his character and of his example as our savior have you seen in these whatever five six poems we've done so far in summary i guess as we end julie says um wait a second leah says i think the um i think the biggest tool the adversary uses on youth and all of us is that he makes us feel that we can never be forgiven and so we don't forgive ourselves we stay in our own way we become our own biggest roadblock blockade he is saying, let go and come to me. Julie says, I think the opposite is also true, that nothing we can do can change the Lord's love for us. Therefore, we can do anything we want. And April says, he always loves us. He will help us and make us whole. We just need to come to him. Um, Leah says, these verses all talk about the atonement. It seems to be a rebuke, but always come back, comes back to coming to Christ. Isn't that you correct? I think, uh, Heidi, you had mentioned earlier that um, we, we sometimes say to our kids, look, this is the rules. This is, this is how we do it in our family. But be, even setting that down is not out of anger, but out of love and hope for the kid. And I, I think the Lord expressed so well in the parable of the prodigal son, where it showed the father this son who was wallowing in a pigsty just a, a week before is coming home. Maybe not smelling too good. And maybe just he's at, he has nothing. And yet his father runs out and throws his arms around him and welcomes him home. And when the brother's mad about it, he's like, son, <laughs> all that I have is yours. Don't worry that I'm throwing my arms around this son not about the comparison it's about i love you all and he's right now needs this love and this acceptance i you have all my love and you always will have all my love don't worry about if more is going to someone else I think we have to, go ahead a lesson to these kids that yes you do have your agency yes you will go out and make choices that may not be good but there's always a soft place to fall and you're, you're never going to be turned away. I think that's important for that because that's why this suicide rate is so high. They think there is no soft place to fall. And it's, I think, up to parents, everybody, friends, to let, um, let each child of God know there is a soft place Ball. it's never too much this is, is just screaming at me that this is what we're being taught here thank you that's the beauty of isaiah that certain things just scream out at us as we read through the the attributes of god just speak out so clearly leah says and what does the father of the prodigal son do he goes to where the boy is he doesn't wait for him to come up the driveway he runs to him that's beautiful. Well, it has been a pleasure to be with you this morning. I hope that as you are, as you're going through the Old Testament this fall, especially with some of the prophets, it's a little more esoteric. There's a lot less stories and a lot more, um, a lot more kind of poetic things. 
help your students to see through the uh, the poetry of Isaiah that the deep feelings of the Lord are there. That, that he's not that much different than them. They might say, well, I'm just, I'm this emotional teenager and I have great anxiety. The Lord says, I'm anxious too for my children. That's okay. That's one of the reasons why I, I can understand you is because I felt those things. I know those things. I love you. I love my children. And there is hope for every single person. And I just bear testimony to that, uh, to you of that is that God does know and love all of his children. He really does run to meet us. He really does uh, weep over us when we're hurting. And it is his great desire to heal us, to put that ointment on our wounds, to wrap his arms around us, because our heavenly parents know that they put us here and the experience we're having here is going to be worth it in our eternal development. And they sent the savior so that our wounds could be bound up. And so, as he said to the woman taken in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Our, and as John three seventeen says, God sent him, not his son in the world to condemn the world, but that through him, the world might be saved. And Isaiah just repeats this over and over and over. And I hope that as you teach your students this fall, that you'll help them to see the Lord's character and his example really powerfully as we go through dozens and dozens of these poems together to see the nature of God and to see the nature of the love of God, of our heavenly parents for their children. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.